Okay, so now you know how to draw axial and equatorial substituents. The question is now, how do you know whether to draw a substituent axial or equatorial on the ring? Which conformation does the ring favor? And I told you before that equatorial substituents are more stable than axial substituents. So of course, a ring will want its substituents to be equatorial. And this general rule will help you out on simple cyclohexanes. So let me show you an example. Okay, so I'm gonna draw two different conformations of a cyclohexane, and you tell me which one you think will be more stable, more favored. Okay, so which one of these conformations do you think is going to be more stable, more favored? This first one, where the OH substituent is in an axial position, or this second conformation, where the OH is in an equatorial position? Okay, easy, right, you guys? It's going to prefer this second conformation because equatorial is more stable than axial. But this is a really simple example. So let me give you two more rules for when rings get more complicated. Okay, so for maximum stability in a ring, you want number one, most substituents to be equatorial, and number two, you want the biggest substituents to be equatorial. Okay, so let's write this down. Okay, so for max stability, for max stability, you want number one, most substituents to be equatorial, most substituents equatorial and number two you want the biggest substituents to be equatorial biggest substituents to be equatorial And let's see how these two rules apply. So let me write up a typical question your professor might ask you. Okay, so your professor can ask you something like this. For example, is this the most stable conformation for this chair? If not, draw the most stable. Okay, so he'll draw one form of the chair up here like this and ask you, hey, is this the most stable? And if it's not, draw the most stable form, okay? So in this chair, you'll notice that we have substituents that are both axial, 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 and equatorial. So let's apply our rules here. And the first rule is that we want the most substituents to be equatorial. So let's count how many substituents are axial and how many are equatorial. Okay, so hey, this CH3 is axial and this OH is axial, so that's two axials. And this CH3 right here is equatorial, okay? So we've got two axials and one equatorial. Two axial, one equatorial. And this is bad news. When you have to have both axial and equatorial substituents, you always want the majority of them to be equatorial. So in this case, we'd rather have two equatorials and one axial as opposed to the opposite of that that we have right now, which is two axials and one equatorial. So to change these two axials to equatorial substituents, we do something called a chair flip. Okay, so what I want you to do here is go ahead and draw an equilibrium arrow right next to this chair. And above this equilibrium arrow, write that we're going to do a chair flip. A chair flip. And make a note next to this that a chair flip is going to change all axial substituents into equatorial substituents and all equatorial substituents on the ring into axial substituents, okay? So this chair flip is going to make all axial substituents change to equatorial substituents and all equatorial substituents 
two axial substituents. So what does this mean? Well, if we flip this chair over, then all the substituents that were previously axial, like this CH3 and this OH, are now going to be flipped to equatorial. And all the substituents that were previously equatorial, like this CH3, are now going to be changed, flipped to axial. Okay, so let me go ahead and draw that result for you. Okay, so this CH3 that used to be axial has now flipped to equatorial. The same thing has happened to this OH. It used to be axial, but is now flipped into the equatorial conformation. The exact opposite thing has happened to this CH3, which used to be equatorial, but has now been flipped to the axial position. Okay, so let's go over how we flipped this chair, because I'm sure a lot of you are wondering how I knew to put which substituents where on this ring. Like how I knew to put this CH3 on this carbon, this OH on this carbon, this CH3 on this carbon, okay? But this is really simple, so don't stress out. To tell you the truth, you could actually put these substituents on whichever carbons you want on this ring, just as long as they are correct with respect to one another and the original conformation. All right, so what I mean is, if you choose to put this CH3 on this carbon of the ring, then you just want to make sure that this OH is one carbon away, okay? Because that's how it is in the original conformation. See, here's this CH3 on this carbon, and one carbon away from that is the OH. And then also make sure that this CH3 is one, two, three carbons away from this CH3, just like it is in the original conformation. Here's this CH3, this one. We want to make sure that this is three carbons away, one, two, three carbons away from this CH3. Do you guys see that? And hey, if you want to double check yourself, then you can also check the relation of the other substituents, okay? So hey, say for example, this OH is one, two carbons away from this CH3 in this conformation. So you want to make sure that this OH is one, two carbons away from this CH3 in this conformation also, okay?